It's This Week in Creationism, Special Edition. Is Mendel's Accountant a Creation Success Story? Let's discuss that and genetic entropy coming up. So why Special Edition? Well, I, I started to collect some items for This Week in Creationism, and I found a, a number of really interesting topics that I, that I wanted to talk and uh, bring your attention to. But one of them, I started to, you know, follow the rabbit trail a little too far down. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought of too many things to say, and I realized that that's too much of a tangent for This Week in Creationism, sort of the big overview. Uh, and so, special edition, we're going to dig a dive into one particular topic from this past week in the world of creationism, and that involves the question of genetic entropy, and in particular, uh, a software program created by young earth creationist and intelligent designist uh, to examine um, the effects of mutations and natural selection. That program is called Mendel's Accountant. And if you've been around Young Earth circles for very long, you'll start to hear this uh, reference to Mendel's accountant and how this is such wonderful software. And what I'm going to do today is we're not going to analyze that software. I'm not interested in getting down into the, the detail. In fact, I'm not really going to land any heavy criticism of the assumptions of that software that gets into something. You're already going to think that this is too <laughs> too nerdy anyway, but I would have to go even a lot farther to get into the, the nitty gritty of that. Yeah, what I'm more interested in talking about here is looking at um, the perception of, Men of Mendel's account and the software among young earth creationists and those outside the young earth creationist community, how the what has been the response to this software package, and taking a little bit of a, a look at uh, who's been using the, this software, what it's been used for, and answering the question, has there really been no peer review of this software? And what does that mean that there hasn't been peer reviewed uh, a response to Mendel's accountant? Let's get into that. First, what I wanna do is I'm just gonna take you to a very recent article at Creation Ministries International that mentions Mendel's accountant and what's called the waiting time problem. And that then got me thinking about some other articles that I haven't talked about in the past that I had wanted to, to mention uh, and kind of skipped over uh, uh, talking about on my blog. And then, how I delve from there into some of the other literature. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of different literature from mostly from Young Earth Creationist resources, but I'm also going to look at some non-Young Earth Creationist resources that reference Mendel's accountant because we want to look to see how has the, I guess we'll call it the secular uh, community, population genetics community, how have they responded to this Young Earth Creationist software package. Uh, and so let's start there by going to that first article and see where that leads us. So here is that article that I just that I just referenced. Um, it was in creation.com just a week ago. It's by uh, Dr. Don Batten. And Don Batten is a PhD horticulturalist plant science um, uh, degree. And he uh, was the former CEO, actually recent CEO, up until just earlier this year of Creation Ministries International. Um, he's stepped down and now he is a, you know, researcher slash speaker sort of, you know, in semi-retirement. And in the Creation Magazine in 2021, he wrote this short article. This short article is, I think it, it's really, you know, a filler for their popular magazine. And it's highlighting an article by Dr. Robert Carter, who uh, wrote uh, it for Creation Ministries International, a more substantive article on Mendel's accountant, which is our topic, right? And so here he's just sort of re rehashing that particular argument uh, and simplifying it for a general audience because the, the issues at play here in terms of natural selection, mutations, and mutation rates, and what happens with uh, uh, mutations over time in populations is a very complex sort of mathematically mathematical-oriented question. 
uh, and he tries to simplify it down to the, the gist of it, which is, um, hey, what's going to happen if, if mutations continue to uh, accumulate in genomes? Uh, then you have this problem of, hey, how long is it going to take to get rid of those particular mutations? And if you can't get rid of the mutations through natural selection, then the mutations are going to accumulate and eventually are going to decay the organism, right? Hence the idea of genomic decay or genetic entropy. Yeah, here's my book right back here. All this is sort of explained in Genetic Entropy, The Mystery of the Genome by uh, Dr. Sanford, who's going to play a major role in my conversation here over the next 30 minutes. All right, so setting this aside, um, here's an article by John Sanford, which references the waiting time problem in human populations and uses this program. You see right down, oops, let me get my pen out. The program Mendel's Accountant realistically simulates the mutation selection process and was modified so that a starting string of nucleotides could be specified and a corresponding target string of nucleotides could be, oh, uh, okay, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm going to lose you if I keep reading this. Uh, the point here is he used Mendel's Accountant in order to uh, quantify, all right, the effects of mutations pushed out into the future on human populations, and he comes to the conclusion that we're all doomed, right? You know, the, that the human population can't persist that much far into the future, maybe a couple thousand generations before we're all so ridden and riddled with mutations that we no longer will function and will cease to exist as a, as a species, as will most other species uh, on this earth. It's a real cheery uh, uh, prognosis. So let's go back to that article on creation.com. Here, Dr. Batten, uh, again, is talking about uh, Mendel's accountant and the waiting time problem. And he's asking, how much time? How much time does it take to expunge a genome of negative mutations? Um, and he says, you know, calculating it is a complex, uh, you know, operation. And I completely agree with that. You know, a lot of things have to be taken into consideration, such as mutation rate, fitness due to mutations, number of offspring, generation time, population size, and so forth. Well, how might we actually simulate this and be able to look out into the future and see what will happen with mutations in populations? Well, as he says, a team of scientists created a computer program called Mendel's Accountant, which does these calculations. In a review more than a decade after the program was first published, and we'll see this program came out in 2007, CMI geneticist, Creation Ministries International geneticist, Dr. Robert Carter, commented, We are unaware of any peer-reviewed paper that attempts to refute the methods or conclusions of Mendel, referring to Mendel's account. After a decade of established work, there should be something. Their silence is telling. Um, if you don't know the nuances of, of fitness and natural selection and mutation, that's fine. I don't, I don't think you need to be able to truly appreciate that to be able to understand some of the things that I want to communicate in this particular talk. Um, it, but, of course, it would help <laughs> because you, you'll see how, how difficult this question uh, is uh, to answer uh, and to communicate. So... I'm going to come back over and over and over again to this quote by Carter, and we're going to go to Carter's paper, and we're going to look at this quote, because this is what I want to deal with, is this idea that there hasn't been any peer review of Mendel's accountant. What that means, is that really true? Uh, and even if it's true, is it relevant? Um, but let's just, let's just go on a little bit farther with Batten's comments to get a little bit of a flavor of what he thinks the problem is. So he's saying, look, this program can simulate real populations projecting out of the future and see how long it's going to take to to uh, to change uh, the DNA in a way. When numerical assumptions are made that favor evolution happening, such as unrealistically high fitness for the mutations, he's saying we're going to give the evolutions the benefit of the doubt. We're going to like give them the best parameters possible. It takes 84 million years just to get two letters lined up in individual. Just to get two individual mutations, which happen randomly and separately, in order to get them to occur at the right time in the right place, hence the waiting time problem, we're going to have to wait 84 million years for the happens. 
Well, then he's like, well, look, this greatly exceeds the time frame, about 7 million years. Evolutions give for the evolution of humans from a common ancestor from chimps. So um, much less any really any other species being able to evolve, although creationists do believe that species do evolve, but uh, by a somewhat different process. But that's a rabbit trail there. We're not going to go down. To get just five letters lined up together in time exceeds two billion years. So if you were to ask, I need these five particular mutations, I need them in this order in order to create this new function for this gene, all right, or change this gene and, to, and create a new function out of it. All right, I'm going to need to get these five mutations, and each one happens independently. How many generations do I have to go through, and how strong is the selection going to have to be on each of those mutations in order to select and, and fix those mutations in a population of a certain size? Those are all the parameters that have to be used in a, in a program. How long is it going to take? And he says, using this program, it tells us it's going to take 84 million years. Oh, actually, that's two mutations. To get five, it's going to take... 2 billion years, right? And multicellular organisms haven't been around really that long. I guess a few have, but certainly not animals, right? And so game over, right? Mendel's accountant, this program, uh, which is so incredibly realistic and so well accounts for the parameters of how we know things function today. And if it gives an answer of 2 billion years, then... All this stuff about an evolutionary biology must be must be false. You can just throw it out. All right, we've proven it's wrong. So you can see the the, the popularity of Mendel's accountant and the uh, the the different papers that have been written that have been based on the work of or the analysis using this particular program. All right, so it's going to take two billion years. It's like game over for a evolutionist, right? This program, Mendel's accountant which, as we're going to see, is going to be claimed to be the best, most realistic program that's ever been made to simulate populations and how populations will change over time, their genetics would change over time. And if this is the best program we have and it can't actually simulate and create viable organisms out into the future, then one of two things has to be true. Either there's something wrong with the program, right? One of our parameters is wrong. Something about our initial assumptions is wrong, right? Or the data we're feeding into it is incorrect. Or evolutionary biology or the assumptions of evolutionary biology uh, have to be completely wrong, right? One of those two things. It's, it's a nice sort of black and white sort of thing, you know? These two can't coexist together and both be true. All right. Now, uh, Batten's article has just four references, and three of them are, are important ones. The first one's the Sanford one. Uh, that's Mendel's accountant. That's the initial, uh, I guess I'll call it publication of the software. The introduction to the scientific community of here's this software package that we have developed it. We're going to describe the software package for you, and we're going to make it available for anybody to use. So, Anybody can use Mendel's accountant. If you would like to, you can go download the program right now. You can put numbers into the different parameters and play with them. I have to warn you, only works on a Mac and only works on a Mac with certain operating systems. I can't remember which operating systems those are exactly. Um, and I'm, I don't think it's the most recent one because there's not a, a very recent update of Mendel's accountant. So it is kind of limited in use, but nonetheless, it is freeware and anybody can use it, and they're encouraged to use it, right? They put this out as a, you know, for the community, even for the evolutionary biology community to use. Um, and so what I'm interested here is what has been the use of Mendel's account? Has the secular evolutionary community found it useful? What has their response been to Mendel's account? Uh, reference number three, Robert Carter. That's another one we're going to look at. A successful decade for Mendel's accountant. You see, I just said we're going to look at how successful it's been. Well, voila, I have Robert Carter here who's telling me that 10 years after the release of Mendel's accountant, he's going to do a retrospective and ask how successful has it been? Well, actually, you can see from the title, he's going to claim that Mendel's accountant has had a successful decade. 
So let's look at that article and see what does success mean to a young earth creationist, right? Has it been successful? Uh, and then I just briefly showed you Sanford's article, The Waiting Time Problem in Human Hominid Populations from the journal Theoretical Biology uh, and Medicine. And that, again, is a paper that uses uh, Mendel's accountant data. And so Sanford is one of the creators of Mendel's accountant. You see the Sanford et al. Oh, let's just go and look at that. Here's the Sanford et al. It's Sanford Baumgartner. All right, Brewer, Gibson, and Remine. And I'm saying those names because I'm going to show a number of different articles. And so as we go through there, I hopefully I'll remember to mention them, but I'll show you the authors of those articles. And you're going to see those names pop up over and over and over again. But these are the folks that uh, designed, implemented, and tested this software package. Uh, and then this is the paper, all right? Came out in a scalable computing uh, I have to look over here. Practice and experience. I couldn't remember the name of the title of that. Uh, and so Mendel's accountant, a biologically realistic forward time population genetics model. And it was published in 2007. All right, and from the very first line of the abstract I have uh, uh, printed over here, Mendel's accountant is a user-friendly and I agree, it's user-friendly, biologically realistic simulation program. Mm, I might have some disagreements with that. <laughs> it's an attempt to be biologically realistic, but let's face it, it's really hard to be biologically realistic in, um, in any software program that is simulating real life. Um, for investigating the processes of mutation and selection in sexually reproducing diploid populations. All right, that's, that's their description of what Mendel's accountant is. Now, from Wikipedia, I, I thought this was a useful uh, description as well. Mendel's accountant is designed to track mutations as they accumulate in digital populations. Right, they're going to create a digital population, give it some rules, rules that hopefully represent realistic rules of how heredity works, and then also rules for mutations happening to that hereditary material. And so the randomness of that, the frequency of those particular mutations, the types of mutations that occur, uh, and then the selective advantage or disadvantage of that mutation or whether they're neutral, uh, assigning different, those different kinds of parameters. Based on that research, right, as we've already seen, Sanford holds that the human genome is deteriorating. So based on his analysis of mutations and their effects, He's come away with the conclusion, and he thinks that this Mendel's accountant program is the thing that statistically supports his, his, his inferences that he has made and written about in Genetic Entropy. Genetic Entropy was written, uh, at, well, published in 2005. Um, there's a more recent uh, updated version of that. I've got, like I said before, I got the 2005 edition, and I honestly, I don't have the new edition. I need to get that. But the 2005 edition, written before Mendel's accountant um, was finished or published, um, and so later comes along, I guess you would say, later comes along the sort of the statistical um, um, confirmation, you know, at least he thinks, the confirmation that this genetic entropy process is real. And he concludes that the human genome is deteriorating, therefore could not evolve through a process of mutation and selection. You know, if it's deteriorating, it's not advancing, and therefore, if all genomes are falling apart, and you would extend this not just to human beings, but beyond to other species, if all species genomes are deteriorating and becoming less fit for their environment, then how could anyone argue that evolution has created, right, all this uh, amazing diversity on Earth? Um, because how can you make something more diverse and more fit for the environment if mutations are constantly wearing down and destroying uh, organisms, right? And therefore, they couldn't evolve through a process of natural selection as specified uh, by the modern evolutionary synthesis. 
So this is his big argument, and um, it's become very popular in young Earth creationist circles. Uh, Sanford is more of a you know an intelligent designist, uh, and many intelligent design advocates are are very much uh, interested in his work and talk about uh, genetic entropy as well. But this is becoming an increasingly popular argument for young Earth creationists to to simply it's sort of like the the gotcha question, right? It's sort of like, hey, mutations are accumulating. You can't get rid of them fast enough. Therefore, the genome is wearing down. Therefore, evolutionary biology can't accomplish what evolutionary biologists claim it can accomplish. And here we have this software package, which you can type in your numbers, right? Your numbers that you've uh, estimated based on real world calculations in today's populations, put those numbers in and then project out to the future because that's what forward time population genetic model means, right? You're looking forward in time at what will happen uh, in the future. And what he always shows is the population has a fitness here and then the fitness just goes down and basically all the way down to the point where there's it's completely unfit for the environment because the mutations take over, right? The mutations take over and there's nothing in his mind or in Mendel's accountant that would prevent uh, the genome form from basically disappearing over time. All right, so let's go to Robert Carter's article, and this is from uh, 2020. A successful decade for Mendel's accountant. A powerful computer program with far-reaching consequences has been developed by a group of biologists and computer scientists. Striking at the heart of neo-Darwinian theory, it tackles the subject of mutation selection using a straightforward method called genetic accounting. Named Mendel's Accountant, this software platform provides a comprehensive refutation of multiple aspects of evolutionary theory using nothing but standard evolutionary population genetics. All right? Now, it's trying to make it sound like it's using nothing but the basic evolutionary, the, the basic genetics that evolutionary biologists are providing. We're just putting in the framework of a statistical analysis of their own stated theory and then showing that it doesn't work. Now, I think that this is a good way about going about things, right? I, th I think this is a, an approach that young Earth creationists should be taking uh, to try to understand um, these models better and to potentially show that evolutionary, evolutionary theoretical models for natural selection and genetic drift and mutations aren't sufficient for creating or sustaining the genetic variability in living organisms today. Um, and so this is an appropriate thing for them to do if they're convinced that evolutionary theory can't possibly have the full orbed explanation of the origin of living of biological diversity. Um, but to say that, um, well, OK, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the developers use it to quantify the actual threshold for new populations and to test evolutionary ideas. OK. Great, I think that's, uh, that's good. Let's see how Carter describes Mendel's accountant in some, of the, in some of his article. Start with that second paragraph there. Mendel's accountant is the most accurate software available for realistically simulating evolutionary genetic models. Um, all right, I mean, that's a statement and he's just, it's just a proclamation. He doesn't have a reference for that as to like anybody else saying that. So I guess that is, his opinion about uh, this software, that it's the most accurate software available for simulating evolutionary genetic models. That has been true since the beginnings a decade ago. Why weren't evolution the ones to produce it or improve on it? Evolutionists had the know-how, plus access to supercomputers and public funding. These are popular uh, arguments used against uh, evolutionary biology by young earth creationists. We don't have as much money, right? We don't have access to stuff. You have all the access. And so, you know, we're playing catch up here. And yet here we have an example of, we've come up with a better program than you, right? Four, five people came up with something that, you know, all of you with all your resources couldn't do. Um, it's a big feather in the cap in Carter and others' minds that young earth creationists have been able to accomplish this. Right, so this, in his mind, is one of the great successes of the program. Um, evolutionists have the know-how, computer, oh, public funding. So why did this group, did a group of what they consider outsiders produce such a program and publicly promote it? Why did they do that? Why did they publicly promote it? 
The answer is illuminating. There existed primitive forerunners to the Mendel's accountant simulation. These forerunners, create, forerunners created by evolutionists were simple by comparison. Yet when realistic values for human reproduction rate and mutation rate were used, they were read, already demonstrating genetic deterioration. Okay, so now here comes the rub, right? You're saying, oh, well, there were other programs for which Mendel's accountant kind of builds upon. Um, but evolutionary biologists had already kind of like backed away from trying to use these forward projecting programs and simulations because whenever they put their numbers in the simulations, they didn't get answers they liked. It showed that there's decay of genomes over time. There's genetic deterioration. And therefore, whoa, we better not uh, continue to uh, you know, make our programs any better or continue to try to publish with these programs because they're not giving results that we like. In other words, the program of genetic deterioration was no long ago, both in theory and computer simulations, but they failed to pursue it further, at least not publicly, maybe behind closed doors. You know, they're secretly you know, gnashing their teeth over the results they're getting. Um, but they're not publicly wanting to talk about this. All right, so this sets up sort of the mini conspiracy, right? You know, this is like, you know, evolutionary biologists already know this. They already know that the genomes are decaying all over. They already know that human beings are doomed, right? There is no future for humanity. Um, genetic mutations are going to destroy all life on this earth in the not too distant future. And so, all biologists across the whole world, including lots and lots of Christian biologists who presumably have access to this data and ha could apply these programs and can see this degradation, they're also hush-hush on this, right? That there isn't any degradation going on and that, that we, sh we shouldn't actually be scared of, of what's going to happen in the future. Okay. I just took a call and uh, completely lost my train of thought. So not even sure where I what I was saying last, but I think we got down to this last paragraph. So let's just get let's just get started there again. Um, even today, anyone might attempt to refute the results of Mendel's accountant by producing a more realistic simulation, but they have not done so, not even in 10 years. This lack of serious response further suggests that Mendel's accountant is demonstrating real problems for evolutionary theory. All right. So, uh, yeah, now I remembered what I was saying. I was saying like we were talking about how um, this is this is the contrast that they're trying to present. Right. Mendel's accountant is confirming things that evolutionary biologists were already grumbling about, you know, in terms of future projections and uh, the, the mutation selection balance not working out for them. And so they're not really even trying to do this kind of work. And so Mendel's accountant comes along and sort of lays bare, right, what is already known among evolutionary biologists, this, this grand conspiracy to sort of cover up the fact that mutations are accumulating and we're all doomed, right, to extinction. Um, now, it, 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 this, this, of course, only works then in a young Earth scenario, right? Because uh, if the world were millions of years old and this process is causing uh, this genetic entropy were occurring over this entire period of time, then there wouldn't be any life here now, right? So, so it's, it's like, yes, that can't possibly be that old. But in a young Earth scenario, they can uh, argue, and a young Earth creationist would argue that the original genome was set up to be perfect, or at least ideal, whatever ideal means or perfect means. And it's just been degrading since then. And so, yes, you can extrapolate back and see that, um, or they would claim, you can extrapolate back and see that the genome was more perfect at one time. And, you know, like Sanford and others would point to, oh, look, the Bible talks about people living to longer ages in the past, and now they live shorter lifespans. And shorter lifespans must be the result of genomic decay such that we can't live as long. Now, that's actually not necessarily true the genetic decay would create shorter lifespans but um it's i think it's a natural inference one that i think people would relate to and so that's one of their evidences that in the past genomes were more perfect and better and therefore they're decaying uh into the future um okay so we're we're, we're at this point now where we're saying okay what is it what's going on here as i said before Either the program's wrong and it's kicking out bad data or the program's right and the world can't really be very old. 
this is why this is such a wonderful uh, and well talked about example by young earth creationist. But now let's look a little bit closer at this idea that, that you, for one thing we're taking his, you know, Carter's word that his statements are true, that no one's tried to refute Mendel's account, that there aren't any more realistic simulations out there, right? No one's done so, not even in 10 years. There's no serious response, right? And because there's no serious response, he's saying, therefore, it's demonstrating real problems. Right. Does that have to be true? Uh, continuing in Carter's article article at the very end, this is the last section. A Google search of Mendel's accountant will bring up multiple hits that criticize the program and the conclusions being drawn from its discoveries. OK, so now we have an admission that there are complaints about Mendel's accountant. Right. There are criticisms. And I found, I assume I found many of these same criticisms and I've been involved and know people that have made some of these criticisms of this program. Uh, so yes, you can find that there are critiques of Mendel's account. So if there are critiques, um, what does he have to say about those? Essentially, none of these attacks are substantive. Now I have to balk at that criticism, all right, or uh, that, um, how he portrays this. I think some of the criticisms are very substantial uh, and I think merit really thinking about. Many are highly misleading. I don't know about that either. It is clear that most people commenting on Mendel have not read either the documentation or the background papers. <laughs> he, he's uh, channeling a little bit of Jensen here, right? Jensen loves to say when somebody else critiques his work, that they didn't understand it and obviously they didn't read it, right? You just didn't read it, you didn't understand it because if you had read it and you understood it, you wouldn't be critiquing it because you'd just be, you know, bowing down to the awesomeness of, of, of this work. Thus, many evolutionists arguing against it don't seem to understand their own theory. <laughs> this is probably due to the anonymous nature of the internet and the level of expertise required to make comments online. Okay, so he's saying he's basically dismissing a lot of the critiques as like, you know, internet interlopers who just, you know, say stuff about it, but don't really know what they're talking about. Well, I, I can't say that that doesn't happen, right? You know, the, that's on all sides, including many, many, many young earth creationists who critique things who have no idea what they're talking about, right? Uh, so let's let's say that's a wash. There are there are those who speak out of turn from all sides. However, one anti-creationist blogger, uh, and he points out, not trained in either biology or genetics, and I'm going to say that some of the authors are not trained in biology or genetics who made the program. Uh, and none of them, I believe, are really population biologists. And uh, the first article we started with, Don Batten, he isn't a, I mean, he is a biologist, but he's not much of a geneticist. Tried to create a credible case for the genetic entropy thesis and thus tangentially attacking Mendel's account. Um, I've read that critique and it's quite good and I will link to it um, at the base. It, it, I, I encourage you to read it and decide for yourself whether it, uh, it uh, has merit. John Sanford has rebutted that review in an important article on creation.com. All right, so, and I've read his rebuttal. His rebuttal is, uh, in my mind, kind of patronizing and only addresses some of the complaints there and kind of takes some pot shots at the easy critiques. Now, once again, you know, he's going to make this very, I think, strong statement. We are unaware of any peer-reviewed paper that attempts to refute the methods and conclusions of Mendel. After a decade of established work, there should be something. Their silence is telling. Right? So he's, gonna, he's claiming there hasn't been any peer-reviewed response to Mendel's accountant. And the only response there have been is by people on blogs and other people on the Internet, on chat groups and so forth have said things about Mendel's account, but nobody has stepped up to the plate, right? Nobody has stepped up and actually written a response to a journal which critiques and outlines their problems with Mendel's account or shows how it doesn't work, how the evolutionary theory or predictions of evolutionary theory um, uh, are accounted for 
by understanding uh, some of the parameters in a different way. All right. So is this a valid complaint? Does Carter have something here? Is he right to be upset or, or to use this as an argument for, hey, their silence is telling. The fact that they're silent, the fact that they haven't tried to, to review Mendel's accountant, that means that we must be on to something. And it says an argument from silence is saying, because you're silent, it means you, you don't have a critique. Because you're silent, we must have the truth. Right now, here's where we're going to get into looking at a bunch of other papers. Okay. Oh, actually, these are the conclusions. Mendel's account represents a milestone in understanding of how mutation selection process operates. And then a bunch of more platitudes about it. And then ending with like, hey, people need to use this particular program. Right. And it's predicting the collapse of Darwinian mutation selection mechanisms. All right, so now we need to back up. We need to ask ourselves, so Mendel's account has been out since 2007. That's 15 years. It's a publicly available uh, software package that anybody can use for educational purposes, uh, for doing scientific research. Right? There's no limitations to, like I, like I said before, you can download it, you can use it, you can try to publish stuff uh, with this. So it's open and available to the, the public. Also, if we had read the paper that introduces it, you would see there's no like young earth creationist creationism in that. It's simply a description of a software package and it presents itself as I'll say it presents itself as a secular material, right? Piece of work because it's just, hey, here's a great way of, of looking forward in populations at what will happen to mutations that enter into the population with certain selectional, certain fitness values, you can then watch the progression of how that mutation might get fixed either in the population or removed from that population. Great. Lots of people are interested in looking at that type of thing. So we want to say, so are people using the program? And who has used it? What kind of publications have come from Mendel's account? Is it successful? in the sense of it's being used, right? Because remember, Carter is saying in this article, he's saying a decade of success. What does success mean? Now, let's look at his references, right? So here we have Carter, Carter, Sanford. Boom. All right, we've got Carter, Carter, Sanford, Truman, who's a young earth creationist. Carter, Batten, that was our first article, uh, uh, first person we looked at, Batten. Um, Remine, that's one of the authors of the original software package. Uh, Sanford, Barnard, Gibson, Remine, well, that's the actual uh, program itself. Um, here they are again. Here they are again. Here they are again. Sanford and Nelson. This 2012 paper is important because they're using it to compare to, this is five years after Mendel's accountant came out. What they did was they took several other software packages which are out there, um, some of which have been developed since 2007. And then they did a comparison of if we feed in the same data into the programs, how well do they predict things? Um, and they get uh, some, <laughs> They get some interesting results, but at the end, they try to claim that their program is still the best, right? Which is why Carter is trying to say that no one superseded uh, Mendel's account. Uh, here we have Brewer, a young earth creationist. We have Carter. We have Sanford. We have Nelson and Sanford. Then there's one reference to Chimera, who is a, uh, a renowned uh, molecular uh, geneticist, works on molecular evolution. And of which Sanford very much is a, uh, a fan of in a way and has developed some of his ideas about um, genetic entropy uh, from or taken that data and tried to use that as a way of developing genetic entropy. Um, and then Ono also secular. But then we go right back to young earth creationist, young earth creationist. And most of these are references to other papers written. And guess what? Many of these are written using Mendel's accountant. So how's Mendel's accountant been used? It's been used by other young earth creationists. And what I'm trying to get across here by circling all these, there's Smith, there's Brewer, there's Sanford, there's Sanford. 
here we have a couple Carters again. Now Carter was an original author on the software package, but he's probably one of the primary users of it. Uh, here we have Sanford, uh, there's Batten again, there's Brewer, there's Smith, there's Baumgartner, uh, there's Sanford, there's Baumgartner, Brewer again, um, there's Sanford. All right, you get the idea, all right? Those are, those are the, that's who has been using Mendel's accountant. So with respect to the success of Mendel's account, it's been used by the authors of the software package itself in order to continue saying the same things they said in the articles they wrote before, well, specifically Sanford, that they wrote even before the software package was completely developed, right? They had already had this genetic entropy idea, create the software package that then statistically tries to prove their point and then they continue to write papers referring to their other papers and referring to Mendel's accountant. Uh, and it just keeps becoming back over and over and over and over again. So when I ask the question, is it successful? Well, it's been, I guess you could call it successful within the creation science community, but I do note one thing. I have to point out that there are others in the, sci in the creation science community who are, have genetics backgrounds and write about genetics type stuff and they're not using Mendel's accountant, right? Now they may not be interested in that specific question. So really it ends up just being five, six, seven people of which only a couple may have some claim to being a population genetist at all. And so this is a very, very small exclusive group that is using Mendel's accountant. Uh, and drawing the conclusions from, them. and a very small group that designed the, the, the and, and I guess designed the software, which means also setting up the parameters for how it would work, right? The mathematical foundation of it, um, how the calculations are done. And of those that did it, only a few of them have biological knowledge, right? So it's not gonna be, terribly, it wouldn't be terribly shocking if they didn't have a full comprehensive view of all of the issues involved in um, mutation selection balance. Now, what I have on the screen here is a, actually, this is a blog of a person who's written a book who's uh, on the next page here. Um, and I was trying to look for what have other people said about Mendel's account. And here we have in the blue there, Mendel's account is the most accurate software available for realistically simulating evolutionary genetic models. It was created by the Institute of Creation Research. Um, crude forerunners of the software were created earlier by evolutionists, but since the software was, did not support their theory, they abandoned it. Now, where did he get these words? Is this something that this guy came up with? No, he read this out of Carter's article and he's just... Uh, semi-plagiarizing it right here <laughs> in his own blog post. Um, this is Doug L., who has written a book, Counting to God, and it's a defense of intelligent design. Um, he is a math and physics, you know, degree, not a biologist. Um, but, you know, this Mendel's accountant is, is great stuff. And here, again, he quotes essentially quotes, there is no peer-reviewed paper that even attempts to refute the methods or conclusions of Mendel. After a decade, this silence proves Darwin's theory is wrong, All right? Silence proves Darwin's theory is wrong. But have biologists been silent? Mm, not really, All right? There's plenty of critiques. And I believe the critiques are strong enough that it's kind of like, yeah, there's a reason why people haven't stepped up to do peer review because no one's using the program. <laughs> it's like if, if all kinds of people were using this program, then there would be critiques from the secular uh, uh, evolutionary biology community because they would be concerned if there was a specific issue or problem with the program and others were using this program and then publishing papers using the results of the program, they'd be like, hey, there's this issue with some assumption of this program and then it needs to be dealt with, right? They would critique it. Pretty sure they would. So why haven't they done that? Uh, like I just said, because no one has published anything using Mendel's account. And it was like, wait a second, I thought people have published using Mendel's account, all right? 
there's 49 people that have cited Mendel's account. 49, right? There's 49 references to the paper that that uh, that uh, introduces the program. Uh, of those 49, 43 of them are from Young Earth Creationist. Now, what's interesting is, what are the other six? What are the six references to Mendel's account that aren't from Young Earth Creationist or Intelligent Design, folks? That could be really interesting to look at those. So I got, I started thinking, I was like, okay, so I'm hearing these claims from Carter that um, this, you know, Mendel's account is like the bee's knees, right? It's the best thing ever. And it's been 10 years and it's still the best thing out there. No one's been able to top it, right? It was the best when it came out and it's still the best. And, and the reason it's the best, the inference is the reason it's still the best is because no one else wants to create a better one because then they would just show that evolutionary biology is wrong, right? That genetic entropy is true. And so no one wants to come up with another program to test this idea. So I thought to myself, I, let me do some searches. Let me try to see what others are doing. Are there other programs out there? Oh, wow. All right. Uh, you know, I've only spent a couple hours and I don't intend to spend much more time than that because it's apparent that Carter's wrong. All right. This is this is not an accurate statement. There are so many different programs. They don't necessarily do the exact same that Mendel's accountant does. But some of the some of the do more than Mendel's accountant does. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with this one because this is a this is actually in uh, the preprint server. So this isn't even a peer reviewed article yet. It's waiting to be peer reviewed. Um, but I'm going to use it nonetheless. Uh, accumulating waves of random mutations before fixation. Okay, we don't need to know what exactly this paper is about. It's a very complex incredibly mathematically oriented modeling paper, right? <laughs> you know, I'm not going to show you the rest of the paper because it's just mathematical formulas. Um, but it's talking about mutations provide variation for evolution to merge. Look at the abstract. A quantitative analysis of how mutations arising in single individuals expand and possibly fixate in a population is essential for studying evolutionary processes, right? This is really important. Evolutionary biologists recognize that. This is a really important phenomenon, right? What do we expect to happen to mutations? How do they get fixed in populations over time? All right, so this whole paper is going to be a description of one form of analysis, a, a model, including the software that you would use to calculate all this stuff. Um, and so, and tons of different analyses doing that. This is just one of hundreds of papers out there that are modeling selection, mutation balances, and all kinds of related effects. Uh, oh, yeah, there is a page of it. I, what I want to do is I thought, and one of the reasons I went to one of the most recent papers I could find is, and this is just a technique for finding other information. Uh, and that's the reason I went with this preprint uh, paper, because it's going to have references that lead right up to 2022. So I just pulled out one page of references to show you. This is out of, I think, 75 references from this paper. And just look down this list. And I have arrows by the ones I think that are most interesting. So that first one there, all right, the first one is uh, genetic progression. Uh, and the waiting time to cancer. So there's that waiting time term. Uh, and I'll, I'll show just a little glimpse of that paper in a minute. Uh, the second one, the speed of evolution and the maintenance of variation uh, in asexual populations. That paper involves modeling and understanding mutations uh, in asexual populations. Maintaining a behavioral polymorphism by frequency dependent selection on a single gene. All right, polymorphism, variation in populations, how to maintain variation in populations is, is the, the question there. Uh, the traveling wave approach to asexual evolution, Muller's ratchet and the speed of adaptation, another theoretical population biology paper. 
genome evolution and adaption in long-term experience with, uh, with E. coli, right? That, that has to do with uh, Lenski's uh, material. And he has a, uh, a VITA, which is a, a, a program, which Sanford has critiqued and says isn't as good as Mendel's account and all that, right? But there are other programs out there that other people are using. And what's what what kind of gets to me is that Carter, in his articles to Young Earth Creationists, portray other models as and other evolutionists as not wanting to do models, not wanting to do these simulations because the simulations show that there is genetic entropy. And yet there are all these other models and other people are publishing with models and other people are talking about models. Um, and they're free for you to use if you would like to try using them. The question is, why don't they show genetic entropy if other models showed genetic entropy? Well, how are they, how are they tweaking their models so that they don't show genetic entropy? And where is Sanford and others like showing how their models don't work because they're lying about something, right? They're, they're faking this data or they're manipulating their models in some way. Uh, this list goes on and on and on and on and on. There are many authors at many institutions that are interested in these questions. They're either studying them in physical uh, setup systems, but they're also analyzing them in with um, uh, simulation software. Uh, but you need to ground your simulation software in realistic assumptions, which means you have to do the real bench work in order to get the values for mutation rates and for fitness values and so forth in order to test your simulations, test your assumptions in your simulations. Um, yeah, the waiting time problem in cancer is interesting because the, the, the idea here is that um, for cancer to develop, you uh, it's not usually a single mutation that causes cancer. It's not like you're, you're sitting here one moment and your cell has one mutation and all of a sudden it goes cancerous. It's an accumulation of mutations over a period of time that causes problems in the cell machinery. Um, that then develop into the um, uh, the condition of cancer. Okay, the cells going haywire, losing their ability to control their their uh, cell division process. All right, so it's an accumulation of mutations. Now think about what that means. That means you have to accumulate multiple mutations in cells. And so one mutation doesn't do it. You have to wait around for other mutations to knock out other genes because there can be many, many different genes associated with a particular cancer and you have to get some combination. Um, now, it, Batten and others talk about using these simulations to show that the waiting time problem is serious for like, how would you, you I probably didn't cover this well enough but remember in that first pair, first uh, summary, you're saying, how long would it take to get two separate mutations fixed in a particular cell, right? Or a particular, in that case, a particular species or population? Um, it would take a long time because they're both random mutations. And to have them occur at the right place and the right time, uh, you'd have to wait a long time to get that second mutation at the right spot. Well, here you have cancer. It's going to take multiple mutations. And that's within a body, within a person's lifetime. And yet people get cancer, right? So we know it happens. <laughs> it's like, we know that, yes, you do have to wait around for the mutations, but it happens, all right? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> the selection, genetic drift, mutation rate, combination of things that happens inside of tissues as they are mutating and, co and copying themselves over time. It's like looking at populations of cells. Right, and so we can do all these calculations, and we can do the we can have these simulations of how long you'd have to wait in order to generate certain types of mutations in order to develop cancer, and the answer doesn't come out. You're going to have to wait five thousand years or a hundred thousand years for this magical combination to occur, which statistically, based on the way Sanford and others want to calculate how mutations happen. Uh, I believe that their model would end up giving rate time periods that would be far too long for the actual observation of this real world, which is people get cancer during their lifetime. <laughs> they don't have to wait till 25 year lifetimes later for the for that cancer to actually arise. I think this last sentence gets to it. The complexity of cancer progression can be understood as a result of multiple sequential mutations. 
each of which has a relatively small but positive effect on net cell growth. Each individual mutation might only have a small positive effect. I know you don't think of it as being positive, but from the cancer's perspective, any mutation that causes net cell growth faster rate, you can think of that as, as positive or, or uh, higher fitness for that particular cell. Um, and even nearly neutral mutations, which Sanford like to talk, st likes to talk about, even those neutral mutations, you might have to accumulate several neutral mutations that are neutral themselves individually, but combined synergistically add together to create a positive fitness effect. And so it's very complex. And yet we know those mutations do accumulate because we know cancer happens and we know it comes from an original perfect cell or perfect genome that later on has a specific combination of mutations that accumulate during the lifetime of that tissue. All right, so what's the response been to Mendel's accountant? I think I already mentioned this. The paper uh, introducing the software has been cited 49 times. Nine are by secular articles that don't appear to have any ties to ID or YC. But the big, the big idea here is the 43 are citations by the original authors or by closely related individuals to those authors. So it was created by a small number of individuals. They then have been using it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then a few other people have been involved in projects with them. And so it's a closed net community that is relying on Mendel's accountant. Has Mendel's accountant been successful with respect to convincing anybody outside that small community that there's value in using it? The answer is no. I can't find anyone that's used Mendel's accountant that doesn't have the preconception of young earth or intelligent design in which they are seeking a particular answer, right? We want to show X and this program will probably give us that result. And I'm being, I know that doesn't sound uh, hmm, particularly charitable on my part, um, but this is the evidence that I that is in front of me, right? I don't see evidence that anyone has objectively used this software and thinks that, oh, these are reliable results. And I want to go out and try to publish with them. Because like I said before, this is freeware. This is written not under the guise of being a young earth creationist piece of material. This is written under the perception given to the secular community. This is just, you know, a really great program for looking at mutations, selection, populations, forward in time. So, but we are interested. What are those six pay what are those six citations? What six people referenced Mendel's accountant that aren't young earth creationists? Um, here's one of them. All right, a couple of them are, are Russian journals in Russian language, so I didn't dig into those. Uh, but I did look at a couple. Um, here's one of them. All right, multiple authors. This is published in 2008. So this is right after Mendel's accountant came out, but soon enough after, I mean, I guess long enough after that they knew about Mendel's accountant. Exploring population genetic models with recombination using efficient forward time simulations. Well, that's what Mendel's accountant claims to do. He uses efficient forward time simulations and they're exploring population genetic models, right? So, we present an exact forward in time algorithm that can be efficiently simulate the evolution in a finite population under the right Fisher model. And down here, you'll see the reference, right? Sanford et al. Now, what are they referencing here? Uh, essentially in the introduction, they're saying, hey, here's, here's uh, you know, talking about coalescent theory and they're saying like, how can we uh, model coalescent theory? And they're saying like, then here are see the word recently. I don't have the rest of the word down here, but uh, recently there have been several attempts to model this and then here they are. And so they did their due diligence. They looked through the literature and they found the Sanford et al. paper in 2007 and referenced them. 
Now, referencing them doesn't mean they use their program, right? In fact, they didn't use their program. They come up with their own program uh, in order to do this. And what I found interesting was, let's look below that reference. Um, and also found, uh, here's Stanford et al. Here we present an exact forward in time algorithm that can efficiently simulate the evolution of a finite population undergoing mutations, recombination, natural selection at multiple linked loci. Oh, uh -huh, that's what Mendel's account claims to do. In contrast, okay, so in contrast to those things that we just showed those references above to existing forward time simulators. So they're admitting there's multiple simulators out there. So Mendel's account is just one of them that consider the population genealogy generation by generation. Our forward algorithm uses the genealogical information for multiple generations at a time. And on the basis of this information, simulates only those chromosomes in the next generation that can potentially contribute to further population. We show that such a forward-backward scheme combined with other optimizations can lead to substantial improvements in runtime efficiency. Now, I'm not uh, well enough uh, acquainted with this particular program to be able to say that this program is better. It's a better simulation than uh, Mendel's accountant. Now, when I read the rest of their paper, they reference some of these other uh, programs. They don't talk about one of these programs being like so much better than the other. Mendel's account is really great, but here's our specific improvement on that. It's just sort of like tossed in as like, hey, here's another one that's out there. Possibly they didn't really look at it very carefully. Um, but I was really impressed with the rest of the article in terms of what they're able to do in terms of simulations. And they don't come to the result that, um, that Sanford comes from. They don't come to the result, uh, a result of genetic entropy, that everything's decaying. Their simulations show that there's a selection mutation balance that's reached. Um, depending on the parameters you use, it'll reach at a different point, but that populations are able to sweep out negative alleles out of the population. Um, Sanford must think that there's something wrong with this model. They're using some incorrect parameter for it to be true. Uh, here is another... Um, paper that briefly mentions Sanford as well, but again, it's just like all the other ones that refer to Sanford uh, that aren't young earth creationists. They acknowledge the program exists, but they don't actually talk about it much, right? It's not as if they're going to use the parameter. So that's why I go back to say, as far as I can tell, no one has used this program. And if they have, I think Young Earth Creationists should be highlighting that. They should be highlighting somebody who's out there actually using Mendel's accountant. Uh, look down here at this. Uh, so even when the number of mutations with deleterious effects, not neutral or near neutral, but deleterious, have negative fitness effects, is up to 10 times more abundant than those of beneficial effects. Right? They're saying... Even in that situation, the highly mosaic gamete structure allows preserving fitness in a population. It means there isn't genomic decay, right? Individuals are as fit today as they were 10 generations ago because of the, the, the factors that they're looking at um, and this particular analysis using uh, genome evolution by matrix uh, algorithms. This is from 2014. All right, so this is before uh, Carter's paper. Now, I started looking and I found one paper after another that, is a, that models a variety of different aspects of these different types of questions. Here's a novel approach. Uh, well, here, a percolation for natural selection. A percolation model for natural selection. This is another one that does reference Sanford again. And this one is probably the most interesting reference to Sanford. I'll say out of all the ones that are not from other young earth creationists, uh, here we have uh, a pair of individuals or several individuals from Moscow State University in Moscow, Russia. And I kind of wondered whether they um, uh, were actually interested in intelligent design. And this paragraph is, I found really fascinating from this paper. Um, Fisher suggested that constant flow of new mutations predetermines an unlimited increase in fitness in the population. That's your upward selection effect, right? That, that things can get 
to higher fitness rather than lower fitness over time. However, in real systems, the ratio of deleterious to beneficial mutations is a thousand to one. All right. Now, that's a really important piece of data. You know, are deleterious mutations really a thousand for every single beneficial mutation? And what exactly does deleterious mean? It sounds really bad. Notice the reference, right? They're specifically referencing this value that they're presenting in their paper to Gibson et al., Sanford et al., Nelson and Sanford in 2013. All of those intelligent design articles or young earth creationist articles. So this article is referencing uh, or is plucking data from young earth creationist material and using that to make their argument for what they're going to now go over in terms of their model as a result see as a result of hey there's this extraordinary number of negative or or uh, deleterious mutations for every single beneficial mutation as a result the effect of mutations that reduce fitness exceeds the upward selection pressure and the fitness of populations may be reduced. Hmm, look at here, Sanford 2018. So here we have an article for which I don't know the authors and I don't know their relationship or if they have any relationship or any knowledge of Sanford and so forth, personal knowledge of Sanford and so forth. But they are certainly giving them some props here, right? Um, I do suspect, though, that those papers, the 2007 and the 2013, those are not written as intelligent design, young earth creationist articles. These are submitted to peer reviewed journals in the secular literature. And somebody who's just looking for and doing searches for information about deleterious beneficial mutations and uh, this mutation selection balance they could easily stumble upon those articles or all they had to do really is stumble upon one of them, probably Nelson and Stan Sanford. And that would then refer back to these others. And so they would look back at those other ones and then they would use those references and it's helping them to make some point. And so they include it. So this isn't necessarily their intelligent design. They have intelligent design leanings and they're sort of like, hey, we got this intelligent design literature and we're going to kind of squeeze it into this secular article. I think it very well may be completely innocent in the sense that they just found these papers uh, and thought it supported something that they wanted to, they, they wanted to support a contrast, right? They're contrasting two things here. And they're gonna try to say, we have a model that will help us sort of, you know, figure out why these two things sound like they're opposites to each other, but we can find a way to mesh them together. So let's look at this blue uh, highlighted portion here. Therefore, our model considers mutations at the population level, positive, negative, and neutral, regardless of their direction, whether they're increased fitness or decreased fitness, as their vector of direction is determined by their adaptive use in a short time interval and may change the sign in the future depending on the environmental conditions. I actually liked this sentence a lot. I thought it was very informative, um, and let me try to explain why. Most simulation models, including Mendel's accountant, you have a couple, you have a bunch of boxes, right? And you can say, here's the mutation, here's the mutation rate, and here are type of mutations. And then I'm going to want to say that every mutation that happens X so often is beneficial or or has or is deleterious and you can assign a like yeah it has this much deleteriousness <laughs> it's this bad right negative fitness value and once you assign the fitness value that mutation then carries that fitness value throughout the simulation so like if you have one that's like this lowers the fitness by 0 0.01 um then a thousand generations from now, it's still doing that same thing if it still persists in the population. It still exists. It's still lowering the fitness value of the population for those individuals that have it. And then if you have another mutation that has a, fit, a negative fitness value of 0 0.02, it maintains that fitness value as well over time. Now, what's really important here is you're saying, look, 
our model is more dynamic. What we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, mutations uh, can be positive, negative, or neutral in a specific population at a specific moment in time. But then we're going to allow the vector of the direction of whether they're increasing, decreasing, or they're neutral in terms of their fitness, what they add to the fitness of that, of that individual. It's going to be determined by the adaptive use in the short time interval. So you examine that population at that moment in time and you say, is this a good mutation, a bad mutation, or a neutral mutation? And that affects those individuals in that population with respect to whether they're going to have offspring and all that, right? But it might change the sign in the future, the sign being this might change. This mutation might have a 0 0.01 negative fitness value for 20 generations. But then in the 21st generation, it might have a neutral value or it might flip to a positive value because it determined, it's determined by the environmental conditions. The environment's not gonna stay the same forever for this population. And this is the thing about most of these simulation programs, you know, what Sanford's doing. It's like, here we have these environmental parameters and here's all these other things. Now we're just gonna let it run for a billion generations, actually 100,000 generations, 50,000 generations. And then we're gonna ask, where are all the alleles and what are they doing? And it's like, yep, they just all decay or, or you know, you know it, it, everything is a smooth progression somewhere. That's not what happens in real life, right? The environmental conditions change. But I'll add one other thing here too, and I think that these authors are thinking of this as well. Mutation happens, it has negative value. Another mutation happens and it's nearby. And that mutation, because it changes the shape of the protein, now, now this other mutation, because it's in a new position on the protein, it might not have the same fitness value. Before it was negative fitness, but now maybe you've tweaked the protein shape because of another mutation. And now the two together create a different combined fitness, which might be positive, right? It might be positive overall. Whereas it used to be when the only the one existed, it was negative, right? They're not truly independent mutations that can be treated as independent every single generation. Multiple mutations eventually affect each other and affect their fitness. So fitness changes over time. So uh, going back to another article I also mentioned, uh, oh yeah, the cancer thing. You can have you can have mutations that have a slight effect and maybe don't really cause a noticeable increase in, in the, the ability for the cell to become cancerous. But once you accumulate four or five of those and then you have one other happen, that one, because it changes this other gene, affects all the others and combined, all of a sudden you have cancer. Whereas if you just had the other, the last mutation by itself, no cancer. It's the combination of all five together. And so it's not an added, well, it's, it's not that each mutation can be treated separately throughout time. You have to consider the fact that they're, they're changing their effects. There's also recombination, which brings mutations into different positions. And so when they come to a different position, they're also going to change their effects, right? So you have to have a dynamic model. And when you have a dynamic model, it takes enormous computational um, uh, effort. And also, it's hard to predict the future in terms of the uh, env environmental changes. So even when you're saying the environment's changing, um, you're going to have to model that change. Uh, it's just really difficult to do those simulations. <sighs> okay, where have we gotten to? I've been, I feel like I've been uh, meandering around, saying a lot of stuff. What's the big picture? Has Mendel's accountant been critiqued in peer-reviewed journals? That's really the question I wanted to ask. And the answer is, uh, of course, not clear. It's a no, but also yes. So what is it? What is it? No. I mean, Carter's not wrong. Mendel's accountant has not been peer reviewed in the sense of anyone has critiqued it. Right. They have specifically gone out and said, I have a problem with this program and this is what it is. And I am going to write it up. 
I'm going to submit it to a journal. I'm going to have reviewers look at it, and they're either going to and they're going to agree or at least agree that's a valid concern. And if that happened, then the authors of the of the of the software package would need to respond in some way, like. But it hasn't happened. You know that's what that's what Carter's objective is. It's like, if it was really that bad, right? If the program was that bad then there would be critiques of it. And my response to that is, uh, no, not necessarily. In fact, not, it's not surprising to me at all that it hasn't been peer reviewed. Because are young earth creationists gonna peer review it? I mean, I would like to see some young earth, I, I know that there are some young earth creationists who have problems with Mendel's account and, and think that it isn't necessarily a, a valid uh, program that that accurate that most accurately reflects real biology all right I suspect they're not going to submit their critiques to a young earth creationist journal about that right it's a community and they're going to talk to them about their complaints but they're not going to peer review it but the peer review that really counts that Carter's really talking about is from the secular community why hasn't the secular community responded it's pretty simple Nobody in the secular community uses the program. So why does it need to be peer reviewed? Like, let's say I'm an editor of a journal and somebody submits a paper to me that is that all it is is a, a review of Mendel's accountant. And it's going to be like, here's all these simulations I did. And here's an analysis of all the assumptions of Mendel's accountant. And here they're wrong here. And they need to do this. And it doesn't account for that. And uh, it doesn't increase. It doesn't account for th this dynamic nature of biology. And you know what the journal editor is going to say? Why would we publish this? Who needs to hear this? Like who in the community is scrambling to find out whether a program that nobody uses doesn't work. <laughs> it's like, it's like, why? It's like, there's no reason to publish it. It just takes up page space. It's just costing somebody money. Right? Why would, and then why would anyone who is not a young earth creationist waste their time critiquing something that nobody uses? I mean, do you think that evolutionary biologists who are in the evolutionary biology community care if young earth creationists are using a program that has flaws for their own work because they already considered their work flawed anyway. Why? And if they wanted to critique it, why would they go to a secular journal to critique that? Because there would be no audience for it at all. The only reason anyone would do it would be just to satisfy Robert Carter and others who are complaining that no one's reviewed it. That's not a good enough reason to review it. It just isn't. Right, so why do I say no, but I also say yes? The reason I say that it has been reviewed, it has been critiqued, is because you know what the, one of the biggest forms of critique is in the scientific community? Is to ignore something if it doesn't work. Right, you've got a lot of choices. Here's a bunch of options. And it's pretty clear to me now, there are a lot of options. And Mendel's account is just one of those. And what happens in, in for, uh, especially in this area, is many people present models and then they publish those and they're put on servers where people can download them and use them for their, their research. And everyone makes their arguments for why my particular model is best, right? Why mine uh, most faithfully and accurately represents the best way to emulate the real world. And so people put out their, their rationale. And Sanford has done that, right? They've done that. They've written an article. They've posted it uh, publicly. And they've made their, their case for why this is a great uh, program. And they didn't say anything about like, hey, you're not using our program because, you know, it shows genetic entropy. So other people would run into this program and then I'm sure it's been downloaded and it's probably been tried by many different geneticists. And if Carter wants to believe that they simply don't want to use it because it's not giving results they like, he can continue to believe that. But it could just be they're not using it because it doesn't work very well, right? That, that many people immediately recognize problems with it 
and they found better programs that they feel like more accurately represent how biology works. And so therefore giving them more accurate simulations, right? So the response of the community has been to ignore. And I don't think they're ignoring them because they're creationists. I think they're ignoring them because the program is not that exciting to them. It's not providing them with a tool that they can use to research, all right, to investigate and to publish. And nobody's published. Nobody has published anything using Mendel's accountant other than young earth creationists who are publishing the same thing that they've designed the program to do. Uh, so in the big picture, Mendel's accountant is, you know, we could spend another hour or two talking about exactly what's wrong with it. But what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm pointing out that the community response indicates there is a problem with it. So I'm not sure what else there is to say. I feel like I'm forgetting some fundamental point, but I didn't write down notes for myself. So that's bad on me this time. Um, yeah, Mendel's accountant, I've, I've downloaded it. I've played with it myself a little bit. And for some things, it's perfectly appropriate to use. Um, but when pushed to answer the types of questions that Sanford and others are most interested in analyzing, it doesn't have the rigor and the power to be able to truly uh, explore those questions. Uh, and it's still too simple to answer those questions. Um, simulations are hard. And the, the reason why uh, all the parameters that one would really want to have in order to explore uh, the dynamics of population genetics, especially in large populations with hundreds of alleles, uh, with changing uh, fitness values over time. There's good reasons why there is no program that you can say is going to be 100% accurate or even exceptional at doing that. Uh, and one of the problems is still computational power. Uh, it still would be very, very difficult to simulate that kind of environment, uh, even with today's processors. And if you think about Mendel's accountant, it's supposed to be downloadable and done on a laptop uh, PC, so not even on like on a supercomputer. And so that alone tells you that uh, it probably doesn't, it probably lacks the computing power to be able to truly assess some of the most difficult types of analyses that, that you would need to do to, to provide the answers that they're looking for. Um, all right, so that's Mendel's accountant. And um, yeah, if you're still with me right now, like more power to you. Um, obviously, if you've hung in this long, you're probably a subscriber because you're just uh, a glutton for punishment um, with these rambly talks that I do. Uh, but if you're not a subscriber and you're still here, then then you probably still you probably want to be a subscriber because there'll be more of this coming, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so I'll be back to uh, this week in creationism and we'll take a somewhat lighter look at the stories in creationism from the past week, hopefully in the next few days. So thanks for hanging with me. Subscribe. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.